Are we good with the camera? Yes, sir. Cool. Uh, cool. All right. So um, thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. And uh, if you saw this, the, the title of this talk tweeted earlier or uh, you saw it on Meetup, you've been probably wondering, what, which, why don't they just tell me which web framework does Upworthy use? Why does Upworthy always do that? Um, and so I, we, we aim to please at Upworthy. So I'm just going to say it right now. I'm going to click through. The answer, of course, is Java struts. Uh, Oh man, that, that joke fell really flat. <laughs> okay, it, it played better in other in, in other audiences. Okay, so for serious though. Okay, so my name is Luigi. Um, I'm the founding engineer, so I was uh, on the founding team of of Upworthy, and um, I'm also the co-organizer of Code for Atlanta, uh, which, as Al mentioned earlier, is um, is kind of a civic hacking group here in town. And we have put on um, some hackathons like National Day of Civic Hacking and Govathon. And we're now doing monthly hack nights. Uh, people are, are working on various projects with a civic bent. Um, so we're hosting the next one on July 22nd. It's at uh, the Atlanta Tech Village hosted by the, uh, the Iron Yard, a wonderful, a wonderful uh, training organization. And if, you want, if you're interested, see us at meetup.com slash code for Atlanta. Back to the topic. So Upworthy, um, how many folks here have heard of Upworthy, have seen it? Uh, cool. So um, at Upworthy, our mission is to, uh, we're, so first of all, we're uh, actually a mission-oriented company. And our mission is to drive massive amounts of attention to the topics that matter most. So what do I mean by that? Um, so the topics that matter most, a lot of people think that Upworthy is like just <laughs> inspirational or fluff, but it's actually, uh, we actually try to do more meaningful substantive content. So here's some, a visualization of some our, of our most popular topics from the last year. Um, so on the bottom there, we, we had a lot of content around standards of beauty and body image, uh, gender equality, um, diversity, mental health issues, income inequality, uh, bigotry, race, race, profiling issues, bullying. So s substantive, meaningful topics. And we try to try to spread these topics as far and wide as possible. Uh, that's where the massive amounts of attention comes in. And from the technical standpoint, massive amounts of attention really means massive amounts of traffic. So we, um, we have, it, it's worked. We, we've been successful. So the site's about two years old, a little over two years old. Um, in our first month, which was April 2012, so a little over two years ago, we did about a million point seven page views. Um, we kind of had a, a very good month last November. Uh, we did about 190 million page views, which was about just under 70 million uh, people came to the site that month. Um, all told, we've served 1.7 billion with a B uh, page views from the site. And this makes us one of the top 50 sites in the US or so. Um, we are probably one of the top most visited uh, rail sites out there, um, and we are among the top 50 or so sites in the U.S. So just um, some, a look at like how our traffic is. So our traffic is actually very spiky. So this is a graph of our page views per minute um, from just a 24 hour, hour period recently. And you can kind of see how uh, kind of the viral nature of what we do le lends itself to traffic spikes. So if we get, we, if there's a particularly popular piece of content that kind of starts going viral on Upworthy, uh, we're going to see just a, a very large, large spike. And it's going to keep going for a while, um, even though, let, let's say, in the early morning hours, we, we kind of have a, have a dip. Um, so it's a very spiky, spiky behavior. <laughs> Um, the most traffic we've ever received at, at once. So this is a screenshot of Google Analytics real time. So about 130,000 people were visiting our site at this, at this moment. So this was uh, when we were having a particularly good viral hit. So what does an Upworthy, what does Upworthy content look like? Um, so this is actually, this is what caused that viral hit you just saw. Um, this was one of our bigger 
uh, more viral things that happened uh, late last year. It's a short 37 second video of uh, a model and being photoshopped and just showing just how much how different uh, from reality the model actually looked after being photoshopped. So we have some kind of static content on the on the right uh, left side of the screen, and then we have this kind of recommended sidebar, like best of sidebar that we serve kind of dynamically from Ajax endpoints. And then when you scroll down, um, there's more uh, kind of recommended stuff. Um, we do some A-B testing uh, in that area. And then we have some sign up forms like sign up to join our list, our email list, or sign up to follow us on Facebook or YouTube or whatever. And then we also have these pop-ups. We, we do far fewer pop-ups than we used to do, um, but we, they, they still happen sometimes. So that's a kind of another element of how we get subscriptions, how we get people uh, coming back to our site. So the topic for tonight is um, how we manage the growth of our startups web app in the face of very high traffic. Um, and so I actually, I originally gave this talk at RailsConf a few months ago and um, while preparing for it, I thought, well, I wonder how many people in the audience are going to think like, okay, this is all interesting, but it's never going to happen to me. Like, I'm not going to ever work on a site that reaches millions and millions and millions of people every day. Um, while I, while preparing for RailsConf, I realized I thought that same exact thing uh, about six or seven years ago when I went to an early RailsConf and the folks from, I think, yellowpages.com were, were talking about how Yellow Pages is, is one of the top uh, rail sites in the world and it gets millions of, and millions of hits a day and I thought to myself back then this is all interesting but I'm not I'm not really ever going to need this flash forward a few years and sure enough I did need this so um, I think the the lessons from from uh, Upworthy are actually quite broadly applicable uh, to everyone and when, when you are lucky enough to work on something that lots of people start seeing that starts going viral um, hopefully you can take some of these these lessons to heart so let's just start from the beginning. Um, so we launched in uh, March of 2012. And at that time, there was just me, an engineer, and a CTO. I, was, uh, I knew mostly Ruby on Rails. I've been, I'd been doing that for a few years back that, uh, at that time. Uh, the CTO wasn't really a Rubyist. Uh, he was a developer, but not really a Rubyist. And um, so I kind of was able to kind of lead as the founding engineer, I was able to kind of guide our technical decision making. And I happened to settle on, well, what, what, should, what should we actually build this, this thing, this website on? And I actually chose Padrino. So who here has ever heard of Padrino? Cool. Who here has used Padrino in production? Very cool. Uh, so just a few, a few folks, a, a lot uh, less than uh, people here who might have done Rails. Um, so what's, what exactly is Padrino? Uh, it's essentially Sinatra with uh, a few more goodies on top of it. So who here has heard of Sinatra? More, more people, right? So Sinatra is a very low, le uh, not very, but a relatively more low level framework, still in Ruby, um, that is usually used to power uh, more simpler websites or uh, more popularly, web services like APIs. So Sinatra gives you a more low-level uh, look at building a web app. You really think a lot more about uh, HTTP verbs, about gets and posts, and um, it's just kind of a, a lower-level thing. So Padrino is kind of like a happy medium. It's built on top of Sinatra, and then it gives you some nice things that, that come from Rails. Another thing about Padrino is that they actually stole some really good ideas from Django, the Python framework. So at the time before Upworthy, I was working in, up in DC for uh, an organization called the Sunlight Foundation, and they, uh, that's mostly actually a Python shop. And so I, I was around a lot of folks doing Python and um, kind of saw kind of what was different between Rails and Django, and I, I actually realized there were actually a lot of good ideas from Django that didn't quite make it into Rails. And Padrino actually took some of those. So uh, one of the ideas is mountable apps. So in Rails, we have something called engines, where you can kind of um, write a discrete module that kind of can be shipped around different Rails apps. And that's what's called a Rails engine. Um, 
In Padrino, this idea is actually taken as default. So a Padrino project has to have mounted apps in it. Um, it's also very middleware centric. This is an idea from Sinatra or, or really from Rack, Ruby's low level HTTP library. So middleware is when you have, uh, when you can imagine the HTTP uh, response request cycle. So an HTTP response comes in and then there's a stack of, so of libraries or software that look at that HTTP request and then do certain things to it based on certain rules that you set up. And then the response is, goes up that stack and then back to the browser. So that's, that's called the middleware stack. And with Padrino, you actually end up writing a lot of middleware. And Padrino also had a built-in admin area, which is an uh, idea that Django had. We, we certainly have the Rails admin library, or actually that's, Rails admin actually is an engine. Um, but with Padrino, it was actually built into the framework. And it was actually just another app, another mounted app. So why, why did I choose Padrino? So I think when you're like an intermediate or too advanced uh, web developer and you've been doing it for a while and you've learned all the ins and outs of Rails or Django or Node or whatever you're working on, um, you, you kind of start to realize that like all a framework really does for you is uh, it lets you write some code in the language of your choice. If you're here, it's Ruby. And then with, with that code that you write, it responds to HTML requ uh, HTTP requests with another language or, or another resource, like H, uh, HTML, CSS, JSON, JavaScript. So all the web framework is doing really for you is letting you write some nicer code and then emitting uh, some more web-friendly resources like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, or JSON. So, when you realize that, you, you kind of realize that, well, you kind of want to do those things yourself, and you kind of start to think how you disagree with the opinions that Rails gives you. So Padrino, on the other hand, kind of give, lets you have more choice. Uh, where Rails gives you the full house, like, you know, you buy, you, you buy into the Rails framework, you're buying the whole house. Padrino really gives you kind of like this foundation to work off of. So what were the good parts? Um, Padrino is just Ruby, it's, and it's just Rack, the HTTP library it's based on. So all you know about Ruby, all you love about Ruby is still there with Padrino. There's less magic. That's a common knock against Rails, that there are just some things in Rails that just happen, and you're not entirely sure how they happen. Um, I personally still don't understand the asset pipeline. I don't know how it works. I just know it does, and then I get really frustrated when it doesn't. Padrino is not opinionated. Unlike Rails, which is very opinionated. If you ha uh, being unopinionated is really good if you have opinions uh, yourself, if you're bringing opinions to the table. Um, if you haven't formed those opinions yet, maybe Rails is, still, uh, is, is definitely still a good, good option. And thinking about writing software in middleware is actually a really interesting, fun way to think about writing web apps. Um, and you can, of course, do this in um, Rails, but it doesn't really lend itself to it. Padrino really does. Also compared to Rails, Padrino is relatively lightweight. Um, there's, just, there's not as much code in the framework itself. And because it's based on Sinatra and there's, there's just not much going on, um, it's, it's more performant. So here was the architecture we employed when we were on Padrino. So Upworthy is just really a content site, right? So um, this, all this larger box to the left here just is the whole Padrino project. And then all the way to the left, the main uh, box there is one Padrino app that we called main. And that was essentially serving the public site, the site that people, when they, they would go to Upworthy, they would, would see. Um, and then the box below it, on, on the bottom, is the admin app. So this was a second mounted app. And that was just the default Padrino mounted app. And that acted as our CMS. Um, so the writers for Upworthy would go into the CMS and then just update their posts, and then they would get um, updated to, for the site. So there's this other interesting thing here with this publisher thing, which is an object, a class. And then there's the Redis cache, which is a middleware layer. Um, and so I, this was uh, kind of the solution I, I came up with when thinking about how to scale the site early on. So I was 
um, I was kind of inspired by the way that movable type works. Um, so movable type is like a very old blogging <coughs> software. Like it's like the, literally the oldest blog software out there. Um, and because it's, it was older and it was built during a different, <laughs> a different era, um, it, it did something really interesting for a web app, which is when you say, so it's a, it was a, just this Perl software. And then when you saved a, a blog post in movable type, it would literally, like when you press save and save it to the database, it would literally write the whole website again in HTML files on the server. So that actually scaled very well, right? Because when you think about a Rails app, um, if you do like the Rails app, the, you know, the blog, the 15 minute blog software, you write a blog really quickly. With a Rails app, it's gonna, you write you know, a form for a, a blog post, you save it, it, it saves it to the database, and then when people hit your Rails app, by default, it's just gonna read from the database. And that's not gonna scale once you reach a lot of, uh, a lot of users, a lot of traffic. Um, movable type went around this by actually just writing, instead of relying on the database, it would actually just write the HTML right to the file system. And then you would be, it would be up to you to set up like an Apache server that just, that just served those static HTML files. So it was actually very performant. So here, it's kind of the same idea. Um, so what I did was I, I built this Ruby class, it was just called Publisher. And all it did was it would listen for whenever a post was updated in the CMS and the admin. And then it would render that, the, the HTML for that post and then store it in Redis. And then uh, this middleware layer called Redis Cache was essentially was serving all of the uh, requests that came to the public site. So for the, actually for the first few months that Upworthy existed, um, it was actually a site that was completely being served from Redis. Uh, there was no, there was nothing else. It was actually, it was literally like, there's a, a request would come in and then uh, it, would, it would always be in Redis because the publisher would be constantly publishing in, as a background task. And then it would um, uh, respond with the HTML or CSS or JavaScript or whatever from Redis. So it, it scaled pretty well and um, you know, it worked uh, somewhat well. So, so uh, a few months went on. So we launched in April and then in June, our second Rails engineer came on board. We were, uh, we were a growing company. And so our engineer, Josh, came aboard. And a few weeks after starting, he said, guys, I think we should switch to Rails. Um, and he was actually, he was probably right. Uh, yeah, he definitely was right. Um, so there were actually some pain points with Padrino. The first one is that the ecosystem for libraries just isn't as strong as Rails. So as we saw when the hands went up, very few people actually have heard of Padrino. Um, and that's just, that's just a, actually a problem with, with uh, being nimble and fast. Like when, when you have to roll your own software um, for things, you're, you're just, and you can't use off the shelf uh, popular open source pro uh, libraries, your, your, your development velocity is gonna be slower. Padrino itself was infrequently maintained. The admin system was actually kind of old, so it was a, it was a bit ugly looking. Um, to their credit, actually, when we finally switched away from Padrino, uh, literally the next day, Padrino actually made an update and um, <laughs> with a better looking admin system. But in, in reality, there was no real community. Um, and it was definitely easier to say, hey, we're hiring Rails developers, and hey, we're, writing, we're hiring uh, Sinatra developers or Padrino developers. Um, so what we realized with this kind of, during this moment was like, the Rails community itself is actually a very, very powerful asset. It's actually a great thing. So we did, we decided to move. We decided to move to Rails. So um, that fall in October of 2012, um, Josh did the deed and he, uh, he created a Rails app. And then he, and because of um, some of the commonalities between Rails and Sinatra and Padrino all being built on top of Rack, which is the, the very low-level Ruby HTTP library, this was actually pretty straightforward. 
So what we did was we, we generated the Rails app, a, a new Rails app, just Rails new upworthy. And then we stuck the Padrino app inside lib, so lib slash upworthy. And then we mounted that in uh, using routes.rb, just like you normally know how to use routes.rb. Routes .rb. Then we uh, kind of went piece by piece migrating things. So the first thing we did is we migrated the, the models and the service objects, the utilities. Those were pretty straightforward. They didn't really rely on the difference between how uh, Sinatra or Padrino does HTTP routing versus the way Rails does it, right? So models are, are definitely lower level and, and that all moved pretty easily. Um, with Padrino, we were kind of rolling our own asset pipeline using Jamit. Uh, but instead, now that we were on Rails, we just went and did the, the Rails asset pipeline. After that, we migrated the front end, uh, so the public Upworthy site, um, just using the standard views and controllers that Rails, uh, every, everyone knows, knows and loves from Rails. And then the last thing we did was we migrated the back end, the CMS stuff. Um, so before the back end was this Padrino app, this Padrino admin area that gave us a bunch of stuff for free, even though it didn't look very good. And then with Rails, now we, we actually didn't use Rails admin, we just built our own custom <laughs> uh, CMS area, essentially, using Bootstrap and using standard Rails controllers. So this actually took quite a while. This took about eight months to do. And it wasn't because we, this was, it was that big of a project, it was because we were a growing company and we were building new features and supporting higher traffic. So we kind of did all of that, what I just went over, kind of piecemeal. Every few weeks, we would tackle something new. And because it was still all Ruby, it was a bit weird to have things in different places in the code base, but we, we made it work. Um, and so it was pretty, it was nice to be able to take that long of a time to, to actually migrate over. So at this point, we were a Rails monolith, right? A monolithic Rails app. Um, a monorail, as it's sometimes called. And we, uh, for most of 2013, we were, we tried to do things the Rails way as much as possible. So, you know, just the standard Rails stuff that you uh, learn when you, you're starting off, we just, we try to stick to the Rails way as much as possible. And it definitely did help our productivity. Now that we weren't on this more unknown Padrino framework, we were now more on the more popular Rails framework it noticeably improved our, our, our ability to, to build new things. Uh, the one thing that we had to do is, of course, think about scaling. So um, at this point, you know, we were a pretty uh, popular site by this time. And so we, we needed to think about how are we going to uh, scale for the traffic. So we actually just used rail standard action caching. So this is a, I mean, this is what is just, you know, when you look at Rails guides online, they tell you how to cache, we just did that, right? Um, so we did action caching on all our content pages, backed by memcached. We put our assets, our CSS, our JavaScript, our images on S3 and then CloudFront, uh, Amazon CloudFront, which is their CDN. And then we just use a lot of Heroku dynos to, to scale. Um, up to 40 dynos running at once during traffic spikes. Um, so we had no more like um, the, that publisher system I described before, we just threw it out. We were just using standard Rails caching. So this kind of worked, but we kind of knew we needed, uh, we needed some, some help because if once, when we had traffic spikes um, and we had this single Rails app, uh, if the database started getting overloaded or if just the dynos, the Heroku dynos would just be taken up by all these uh, requests from the uh, from the outside world, the our writers, our curators, couldn't like get into the backend system to to do to actually do their work. Um, so we, we kind of needed a better scaling story here. And so um, what we did last fall in September 2013 is we we moved to Fastly as our CDN. So Fastly is really um, is really cool. Who here has heard of Fastly? So Fastly is a CDN. It's like um, Akamai or uh, Amazon CloudFront, where you distribute your assets to this global network of servers all around the world. There's many of them, dozens of them. And the idea is they serve your traffic much faster because they're, located, uh, they're physically located nearby the people that the, your users, your user base. So 
Fastly, in particular, is really just hosted Varnish. So Varnish is a very popular caching server, um, very robust, and Fastly is just hosted Varnish. So we moved not only our CSS and JavaScript and images to Fastly, we also moved our HTML. Um, so that was a really kind of big difference, right? So uh, when people requested upready.com for the website, they would actually not hit our, our Rails app. They wouldn't hit our, our Rails app on Heroku. They would just hit Fastly. <coughs> so we actually turned off Rails action caching at this time because we didn't need it. Um, and then we just set the cache headers for our HTML pages as appropriate for Fastly. And then we actually didn't need all those Heroku dynos anymore because, um, because now the public HTML pages were being served from Fastly and not from our Rails app. So we only needed things for Ajax requests. So this was actually a huge win for us. Um, so if, if you're, you're experiencing pain, definitely think about using Fastly. Um, it was definitely noticeable for us on mobile. So our, our page, uh, perceived page load time in, in, on, on mobile devices went way down. And that was because, of course, with 3G networks and, or even 4G networks, they just aren't that fast. It's just so much more efficient to have your site living very close physically, your HTML living physically close to where your users actually are. And, um, since we actually, so we implemented this back in November or so, and we've had literally zero downtime on our public site since using Fastly because essentially our whole public HTML, our whole public site, whenever anyone in the world visits upworthy.com or any content page on upworthy.com, it's served from Fastly. And we just, there's, because it's a, a robust CDN, it just has never been down. Like we, we just haven't gone down. So there were some pain points with the Rails monorail. Um, so there was still one Rails app. And even though we had Fastly to alleviate like so much burden, um, there was still burden based on some Ajax requests we had. So the Ajax to serve the recommended content in the sidebar or the Ajax to serve our AB tests that we run on the site, that was still getting hammered pretty well, uh, pretty heavily when we had high traffic spikes. Oh, and those traffic spikes could render the back end unusable. And uh, it was just, at this point, we just had a lot of code. And uh, there were God objects that were starting to appear because it was, it was a large Rails app. So then we decided to do the breakup. So um, we decided to split up our Rails monolith into uh, many apps, or, or n number of apps. And so if you actually look at this timeline, we actually have done all these kind of changes very evenly spaced out. So every about eight or nine months or so, we kind of, that's when we do these, these architectural changes. And I don't think it's been, um, that it's not been something we thought about. It's just kind of the way it's happened, but it's, it's a way to deal with the, the incoming needs of a startup of having new feature requests and, and other things coming in while dealing with these architectural changes that you know you have to make. So it's, it's totally cool to just, kind of space all these changes out. So we decided to actually split the monorail into just two Rails apps. So we have now, and this is the way we are now, which is we have one Rails app called www, which is, serves the public site, and then an app called CMS that serves the, the, our curators, the people who actually are writing content for us. So how did we do this? It was actually quite straightforward. So we cloned our big Rails app, um, into two separate Git repos so that both apps still maintain all the history from a few years back. Um, and then we just started splitting up the controllers, the views, uh, the assets into the two, into, into the two uh, apps. And um, what we then did is we deployed each new Rails app to its own Heroku application. So was, there was like the old old Upworthy Heroku application running, and then we created two new Heroku applications. And then to serve, to not have any downtime with a public site, all we did was we actually just switched Fastly which, um, which, which app it was pointing at and which app it was caching from. And so there was, there was no downtime for, for the public. So they just 
thought it was just the same upworthy they've always been at, even though we actually just switched the, the backend apps um, from, from behind. And that, that was actually something that we didn't realize would be a benefit, but it was definitely a benefit with, with Fastly and having a CDN there. And then we started to dedupe de the code between the two apps. Um, we created this core gem, which is mostly models and service objects to keep code dry. And um, now Heroku-wise, we have, so our, uh, our CMS runs on just two dynos because only a few dozen people ever uh, access it per day. And then the www app, the, the public site, runs on uh, two performance dynos, which are Heroku's new dynos that uh, are s for serving larger applications. Um, they're, they're essentially larger Amazon instances. And, and un usually when you have a Heroku dyno, you share it with other people. But with performance dynos on Heroku, you just, just kind of get the whole uh, Amazon instance to yourself. So this is what our, our, our multi-app architecture looks like right now. And it actually kind of looks like the way it did before under Padrino. Um, so with the difference, of course, that they're just, they're now two distinct Rails apps, www and CMS. And then for um, public, the public, whenever they visit upworthy.com, they first go through Fastly, and Fastly does right through caching. So if, if Fastly has that asset cached, that Fastly will serve it, and that is the case 99.9% .9 of the time. If it doesn't, if it's a new, if it's a new page or, or we just did a deploy, it'll go, it'll ask the Heroku app at www, hey, do you have new content for me? And then it'll trickle up back up to the visitor, to the public visitor. And then for our staff um, who are using the CMS, they just directly access that through their own URL. So how many requests? <coughs> You, you get like 100 requests per second during a busy time on the public site. How many per second do you get on the CMS site? Um, so just less than one. It's just, there's just literally just a few dozen people who are ever accessing it, so it's very, it's very little. It's just like a, just an internal Rails app, essentially. Um, so what are kind of the benefits of the multi-app architecture? So the first thing is that instability in one app doesn't affect the other. So if we get hammered on our public site, the CMS is left generally stable. Um, the only time it isn't is if the data, one of the databases gets overloaded. The apps have different scaling needs, so we can scale them differently and provision servers for them differently, different, uh, as, as needed. Um, there's actually a better internal way we work on the team now, um, so we, we kind of people can kind of work on the two apps separately and the people don't trip on each other as much. There are also some um, drawbacks to this. So the big thing is when you, when you have a mini app architecture, then in development mode, if you're working on a feature that crosses both or all the, the apps, you're gonna have to run all those on your, on your workstation, right, as you're developing. So you either have to write scripts to do that or you do it manually and you just have to kind of think, always be thinking about that. Um, when you're deploying to, that's a, something you have to think about. If you're deploying a new database schema or um, something like that, you have to coordinate the deploys uh, well. And then if you want to actually migrate to something that's fully dry, so if you've had, two, you've had one big app and then you, you split it into two, um, where to put new things or where to put old things isn't always uh, obvious. So like, where does this class go? Where does this Right, and um, usually you try to keep like a new a new class in one of the apps, and then when, once you need it in the other app, you you put it into the the shared gem. But it's not always obvious if that's the right decision. So some future work we're going to do. Um, we're going to continue adding to this core gem that shares between the apps, uh, deduplicating the code. Uh, we can consider breaking up the apps even more. So right now, our www app serves both our static content, which eventually gets cached by Fastly. Um, but in reality, we could probably even have like a static site generator, like kind of like Jekyll or Middleman, and then an Ajax API service for all our JSON stuff. Uh, right now, we the two apps share a data store. So there's a they share MongoDB and Redis. Um, 
So should they communicate via a RESTful API layer instead? Maybe. So um, some lessons that we've, we've learned in the past year, two years or so. Um, so we, when we were building all this, we really waited to make architectural changes until it really hurt. So you saw that with, it was every like eight or nine months is when we actually did something major. Um, and it's really okay to, to do that, especially if you're sticking with generally the same technology. So like if you were, since we were on, we started on Pedrino, we were on Rack, which is Ruby's um, uh, HTTP library. And because of that, we were able to kind of slowly but surely migrate over. And so if you're using something like, um, if you're using Python, there's, there's also cor uh, correlation. There's like WSGI and Flask and Django. So from a scaling perspective, it's really beneficial to serve your stuff from a CDN if, you're, if things are slow in any general way. So if, if people think are saying your site's slow or if you're seeing that your servers are slow, like really think about caching things and serving them from a CDN. And just remember that in the end, from, from a performance standpoint, you're just serving HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and, and probably JSON, and that um, all the stuff with the framework that you're using um, is really secondary to, to what the end goal is, which is generating those things for people to, to actually, for browsers to actually download. Um, and this kind of uh, scaling story can happen to you. So, so really do um, keep that in mind. So that's all I have. Um, any questions? Yeah, so uh, you're talking about the static content versus what you're serving from like your Ajax API. Um, what's something like, wh what is an example? This one, maybe it is. Uh, so what's an example of like your static content on the page versus your dynamic content? What would you be serving via like an Ajax driven API? Right. So um, we'd be serving like, um, I'll show a screenshot. So like on the sidebar, like this is all kind of dynamically generated depending on who the user is and um, what we're actually, we, we, if we're doing a test, like an A-B test, um, this, that's all dynamic, so that's, that's one thing. So they're essentially corollaries, they're, they're um, additional things to make the user experience more dynamic on, this, on which is mostly a static, site, a static page. Other questions? Yeah, I saw that you used uh, CloudFront. Oh, I saw that you used CloudFront before. Um, was there a reason for switching to Fastly? Or what yep. Um, originally, when we were f switching, when we decided to switch from CloudFront to Fastly, CloudFront did not pass through post requests. So um, we had post requests for Ajax. So we needed uh, a CDN that could pass that through. Um, CloudFront now supports that. And then, so that happened, that was another thing, like we, we chose Fastly because Fastly could do, could, could support posts uh, being passed through, but not CloudFront, but now CloudFront actually does it. Um, so we could switch back if we wanted to, although we just generally like Fastly better, I think. It's the, the Varnish configuration is nice, like since it's built on Varnish, there's all this documentation about how to do Varnish configuration, and that's helpful. There's not so much on the CloudFront side because AWS is, is, is just whatever AWS, you know, documentation AWS provides. And also because Fastly is more like a startup, they just do better tech support, things like that. Questions? Uh, yeah, on the uh, pain of developing multiple apps at once, have you tried Vagrant or Docker or anything to kind of automate that process and make it easier on the developers? No, we haven't. That's a, that's a good idea. It's something I have started looking into, but could use some better ideas for how to do it. Cool. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> so you said you split up common libraries to use in both apps. Yes. Did you wind up fighting with Rails a lot by reusing model code and then, say, not having it reload or, or things like that between two different applications, or how did you do that? No, so we, um, so essentially what we do is we have a, so we have a gem, a, a gem that has the models, and then in the Rails app, um, 
we actually have essentially stub files for each of the models that we use. And the first thing, the first line of that model is import the model from the gem. And then we actually open the class. And if we, there are any app specific things in there, that's when we uh, do it in, in that app. So it's, it's actually using Rails's, um, that's, Rails is very liberal with letting people do, you know, open classes. Um, so we just take advantage of that. Other questions? So you said you're sharing the, uh, the MongoDB database, the Redis data, data store with the CMS and the publisher, is that right? Um, we don't actually have a publisher anymore. So um, yeah, it's just the dub.dub app and the CMS app gotcha. share it. And then there's the core gem that is just included in both. So apps. if I flood the CMS with traffic, can I knock the production side offline? <laughs> You could, um, so you could definitely knock off the, um, the Ajax, because www is, serves on Ajax, um, our Ajax stuff. But you couldn't knock down our uh, public HTML, because that's all in Fastly. Right. So how might you mitigate that, that sort of concern? Yeah, so that's, that's and it's, it's happened recently, too, because uh, our, our database was just getting huge, and we didn't understand why. And it was getting slow, and, and it was hard for us to diagnose what exa exactly was happening. Um, the only thing we have thought of so far is to create uh, kind of like a API web service that lives on top of the database and then kind of intelligently routes things based on which app is requesting it so that it, it mitigates the dam any damage happening to the databases at that level. Um, that's one, one thing. Yeah. Are you not using sharding and slave up replication to handle that specific? I mean, it seems like that's what MongoDB sharding and slave replication mm -hmm. specifically yeah. for. Yeah, we have we have replica. It's there's a it's a replica set, um, but um, it was specifically there were there were queries that were long running, and uh, scaling the hardware wasn't wasn't helping. Um, but yeah, if if I mean we we've, we've scaled the hardware many times already as we've grown. Um, but you know, there will always be that like, oh no moment when we have a lot of traffic and we just don't fully understand what's going on. You know? And um, so if we can mitigate that at another higher level, that would probably be ideal. Um, I wanted to know like, when you made that change to Fastly, like, what, like how much the request fell you know, instead of people hitting your site directly, you know, how much of a drop was there after you put in the Fastly solution? Right. So it was about, um, it, was, it wasn't too much. It was about maybe like 25% only because we do a bunch of Ajax calls also. So like, so when you download um, a web page on Upworthy, there's also a bunch of Ajax calls that get called to, to do the, the sidebar and to do some other testing we do. Um, so if for any given page view request, there might actually be like three or four requests to our, to our server, just because there's the, there's the HTML and then there's three, two or three Ajax requests. So our total um, kind of what Fastly took care of us was the HTML request. It did not take care of the Ajax request. So because of that, you know, our, our requests went down just maybe 25% to a third. Um, but that was enough to be, like, to be very helpful at that scale, you know, so. Um, yeah, this is a cool talk. I appreciate it. Um, so I was wondering about, like, if I had a front-end JavaScript kind of thing where I had a huge JavaScript library that I had to go to the client every time there was a request, I mean, it seems like a good use case for something like Fastly too, right? Where I have distributed. Oh yeah, if if you have if you're it's a so this isn't a JavaScript heavy app, but if you have a JavaScript like single page app or something like that, right. definitely cache that in Fastly, and then. And then the same thing, right? So I just have some Ajax requests for my data. Mm -hmm. And, and like so if the data, data if the Ajax request for the data is mostly static, like it doesn't change very often, um, that's something you can cache at, a, at the CDN level, and you should because mm -hmm. if if it's something that's unique to every user. Um, then you can't do that, obviously. Right. But well, maybe some of it I could, and some dynamic data I could have quicker. On yeah. So I mean, we we I mean, for certain endpoints, we do things like expire after ten or fifteen seconds, just 
if, if, if it's updated somewhat frequently but not real time per user, we say, okay, and cache it for 15 seconds. And then, um, so Fastly will serve it for 15 seconds, and then after 15 seconds, it, it leaves the CDN, the CDN's cache, and then it, there's another request to our Rails app. And so when, when we have um, thousands of requests or tens of thousands of requests per minute, um, that, that's just very helpful. Like it just mitigates the, the stress on our Rails app. Yeah. Um, in that same vein, uh, how do you handle the, anal so I, I assume you're do you said you're doing A-B testing. Are you doing something like where you're tracking the analytics for the things that, so if you have some Ajax that you're caching for 15 seconds and fastly, and then sometimes it changes, how do you handle the analytics between those two? Um, is there a way to know, oh, this um, segment, this component of the page uh, was hit four times in Fastly. Do you have some way to aggregate that information back up? Generally, we don't. All that stuff, we, we don't have Fastly touch at all. Um, we, that goes directly to our, either our www Rails app uh, for some things. We also have an analytics service written. It used to be written in Node, now it's written in Go that does just general web event analytics um, that I didn't even talk about here. Um, so yeah, I think at that level, I think it's, it would have been too, I mean, we could probably do it with Fastly, but at, at that point, we were just like, we'll just use um, webs, a web app that can handle that amount of traffic. Yeah, you talked about uh, using Mongo and uh, Redis, but you didn't talk too much about your Mongo setup. So are you doing like, you know, replica back shards or like are you using hosted Mongo? Right, so, sure. Um, so we use Mongo HQ and we have since the beginning and they've been great. Um, and we have a replica set with some medium large-ish instances with them. Um, we, don't do, we don't do sharding um, just because we don't, we don't have that kind of need of, of scaling yet. Um, we essentially just, we used to do a lot of writes. We, we've kind of gone down on writes, but um, yeah, we just, we've used Mongo HQ and as we've, as the site's grown and as we've ne needed more scaling uh, help, they've just, they, we've just leaned on them to scale for us and like to recommend um, the best solutions for us. And I think that's just actually a broader point like since we were on Heroku since the beginning also, we, we've always just like relied on these vendors to do these uh, sysadmin DevOps work for us. Um, and so it's just, it's actually worked very well. I mean, it's, um, I could, I would hate to like be running our own servers on AWS or something. It's just, um, it's just so much easier to just rely on, on these third party services to do it. I was just really curious, um, do you have any like uh, cost numbers when you move from 40 dynos on Heroku over to like the CDN solution? Um, actually, from a total, this is something that we actually talked about. So, so from a total like cost perspective, I think we actually ended up paying more uh, when we moved from a CDN just because um, even though we were able to, to dial down our, our dynos significantly, the cost of serving a CDN because, you know, they, they're, there's servers all around the world. Um, that cost of that monthly cost of, of Fastly is probably probably just barely outweighs this, the cost savings we got from Heroku. So it it really depends probably on uh, a, a web app's traffic patterns, like if that's going to be the case or not. But for us, it was just mostly a wash, but we, or even a little bit more expensive. Um, one of the most surprising things for me is, is with that amount of traffic, you're on Heroku. Yeah. Are there any, and I understand you don't want to bring DevOps in, in house. Are there any drawbacks to being on Heroku? Anything that it, you've been limited mm -hmm. by being on Heroku? Yeah, I mean, definitely um, there was a, a, a very big outage a few weeks ago that every, a lot of people, I mean, it was affected most of their um, most of their customers, and at that point, like you're kind of powerless as a customer. Like, 
they have this, you know, there's this outage Heroku wide and you can't really do anything about it. And that happened, that's happened a, a couple, probably a lot, um, not a lot, but like more than uh, you'd, you'd want. And um, so yeah, there's this kind of trade off between uh, leaning on them versus like being able to say, oh, well, this service is down. I'm going to have some infrastructure to spin up servers on another service. Um, and we just haven't, we just didn't build that. Um, and it just, from a judgment perspective, it just hasn't been worth our time to do that. Um, now that we're on Fastly, when Heroku had that outage, our like, our Ajax request might have gone down. Like, like what what actually happened when there was an outage was um, that sidebar just there was no content for it, so the page just didn't render it. Um, so people could still see their content, but some of the Ajax stuff was down, and then our writers could not access the CMS. Um, so that hurt us from like a workflow perspective, um, but with Fastly, with, with that CDN, to the public, it, looked, it still looked like our site was, was working. Um, so we, we heavily um, lean on the CDN to, to do that sort of thing for us. With um, your dub 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 being uh, kind of the API bottleneck at the moment, mm -hmm. um, have you and y'all already looking at Go for uh, some analytics purposes? Have you looked at uh, moving any of that dub 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 API over into uh, Go? Um, yeah, so um, possibly. Um, it really depends on what. So I think. Probably not actually because we have so much code written in Ruby already that we, we, we would still have probably, it would probably be like a Rails, Rails API app um, or maybe something else, I don't know, or like a, a Sinatra app, I, I'm not sure. But um, we do use Go for, um, we have, a, so essentially we, we do our own in-house analytics. So essentially whenever someone does anything on the site that's logged as a, as a user event, and that you know that's that's many millions per day. Um, so we have a Go server that um, reads. So this is actually where we actually use Heroku for something very important, which is Heroku has this thing called a logplex, and the Heroku logplex is this very scalable logging system of of, of across all your dynos. And so we ta and that logplex has this thing called drains. So you can actually drain logs from. Uh, you, can, you can set up a drain and then read the Heroku logs from there. So the program that reads those Heroku logs is written in Go. And so it's just a very, like, it's, it's using one Heroku dyno, and it's processing many tens of thousands per minute, so it's very scalable. Um, so that's where we use Go now. It's, it's for processing all that data. Anything else? Cool. Thanks, everyone. No. So, actually, I guess I don't have to ask, but so on the two app app um, where there's two Rails applications that share a data store, that's actually a pattern that I have used several times. Um, there are, are reasons often for security. So, for example, there's two very different classes of users. Um, you know, the back end administrative type has access to a lot of things. The front end where you really just want read-only access. And what I have done in those instances is um, with the shared SQL server, actually carve down the PostgreSQL permissions to where it's read-only and maybe even read-only to a subset of the fields in the table and then, and then use that. Is that something you do as well with, with your shared data store here? Or? No, we don't. They're, they're both public web, like they're both for serving the website or public stuff. So. Uh, we do not, we do not do log, like that sort of thing. No. I mean, we have we have an analytics database, but that's another, it's a whole another place. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.